Good afternoon, and welcome to today's McGill Alumni webcast, the first in a four-part series in partnership with the McGill Sustainability Systems Initiative, looking at environmental, social, and economic sustainability, and the role that McGill researchers, students, and administrators are playing to help us understand and support more sustainable approaches and practices. My name is Dara Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement, and it's Thursday, September 3rd. The COVID-19 pandemic may be the defining story of today, but issues such as climate change, ecological degradation, and the pursuit of unsustainable practices are challenges that will might remain with us long into the future. And our response as a society might very well define the future of our planet for decades to come. Sustainability also forms one of the grand challenges at the center of Made by McGill, the campaign for our third century. And the university is taking this singular moment in its history to refocus its priorities on developing sustainable solutions to help the world do things right for the future. It's a multi-pronged approach, but one that is being led foremost by our researchers. More than 160 McGill professors from 22 different academic departments working together on all aspects of sustainability, from the natural sciences to law, sociology, urban planning, and more. Today, we will meet two of these professors to discuss several angles of the sustainability challenge, including the question that is at the forefront for many, and that we chose as the title for this week's webcast, What is Sustainability Anyway? So let's get started by introducing our two panelists. Elena Bennett is a professor at McGill, jointly appointed to the Department of Natural, Re Natural Resource Sciences at McDonald campus and the McGill School of Environment. Her research revolves around understanding and managing ecosystems and the impact humans can have on landscapes through agriculture and other activities. She's also the co-founder of the Seeds of Good Anthropocenes project, which I'm curious to hear more about. And Kevin Manaw is an associate professor, jointly appointed to the Department of Geography and the McGill School of Environment. His main area of focus is on urban planning, Specifically, he studies how decision makers balance, prioritize, and trade off environmental, economic, and social equity objectives when planning urban growth and development. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for taking time out of your schedules to spend some time with us today. Before we jump into the conversation, a reminder that if you're watching live and have questions for our panelists, you can send them in via email to aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll do our best to address them to our guests. So before we dive too deeply into today's topic, I'd like to find out a bit more about each of you and your work at McGill. Uh, Professor Mana, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a bit about your teaching and research work and how your studies of urban planning intersect with sustainability as well as the wider environmental issues that the world is wrestling with? Sure, thanks. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm, I'm jointly appointed in the School of Environment and Department of Geography, and I also co-lead the MSSI Adapting Urban Environments for the Future theme. Um, which is a multidisciplinary look at um, understanding how cities um, I mean, kind of play this really fascinating role as, as both uh, a sort of cause of environmental degradation in some ways, but also a really promising solution. So a lot of my research sort of focuses on that kind of tension of, of cities and development. Um, and, and as you mentioned, I, my background is, is in urban transportation. Uh, planning, and so that's really what got me into what, or sort of what motivated me to get into that field in the first place, was really these questions around, um, you know, how our how we get around and these decisions we make as a society and as individuals in terms of how we, um, you know, travel day, and on day to day basis, you know, has huge implications for environmental and sustainability challenges in terms of you know the cars we drive and the, the roads we build to 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 move them um the parking lots that we we build to to store them i mean there's this you know this this auto dependency is is a very big um, um sustainability challenge which which what i focus on and as you kind of already mentioned I, I look at that both from sort of individual standpoint in terms of how people make choices about how they move around but sort of more importantly in terms of how decision makers and, and cities and transit agencies make decisions about where where to put transport you know where to build a bike lane um, and these sort of, and I'm also very motivated by these sort of looking at these disparities between neighborhoods in terms of you know, who has access to these safe places to, to, you know, to bike or, or to walk or to use transit. And mm -hmm. as far as so my, my teaching, you know, I, I teach a course um, in, in the School of Environment called um, Environment, Society and Sustainability, which really grapples or gets students to grapple with a lot of these ideas about this sort of multifaceted ideas of, of, of sustainability. Um, these kind of questions, what, what is it? You know, what's the role of, of society, environment, and, and sustainability? Um, how do we know, how do we know when we see it, so to speak, you know, in terms of how do we define and understand these issues and challenges? 
and I teach a, a more specific course um, called Urban Transport Geography, which looks you know at the history of sort of how we got here, how, and what what are the sort of you know political and, and social and historical factors that, that led you know cities and transport systems look like this, and and how can we how can we change them? And you know I, I need a team of grad students looking at these questions as well from both both a lot of qualitative and quantitative methods in terms of understanding. Um, but sort of yeah, how can we change what, what we how did we get to where we are, and how can we you know build cities and our transport systems in, in a more sustainable way? Mm -hmm. Great, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to tackle some of these issues uh, in, in our hour together today. I'm always curious, though, how people fall into their, their various careers. Um, did you grow up in a big city surrounded by, you know, traffic and smog, and that's what led you to think that there's got to be a better way to think about all of this? Uh, no, I, I, actually, I, mean, I, I grew up in sort of small town in suburban uh, Midwestern U.S., um, and then I moved to, to Boulder, Colorado for my, for my undergraduate degree which is definitely not a, a big city. I, I think that was one of the first places I was exposed to, um, you know, a sort of pretty impressive system of bike lanes and, and things. So, so I remember thinking about how, how cities, how the way cities designed can influence um, the way people get around. Because I hadn't biked much and as a kid, I did. But then you know, in my teenage years, I didn't. And then, then I found myself kind of, you know, very much changing the way I, I, I got around based on the way the, the city was set out. But, um, but at, I guess, as I kind of already mentioned, I think a lot of my um, kind of interest in this is just understanding how how decisions that, that city planners make, you know, are have very long lasting implications. And and so I didn't necessarily grow up in a polluted, horrible place, but um, but I've also always, always been fascinated by this this sort of dual role or this kind of tension with you know the whole the whole sort of profession or field of urban planning was based on getting people outside, you know, getting out of industrial sort of polluted slums. And, and I think it's, I think something that we're still kind of reconciling with is, is understanding that a lot of those ideas of getting people residences away from polluting factories and, and, you know, and you know, pollution in the streets and things um, to get people out out in the country and, and have bigger um, bigger lots and, and bigger houses. And I think one of the most sort of fascinating or sort of almost perverse outcomes of this is is this has then led to a lot of the, these other environmental um, sort of problems we see decades later in terms of the, because people no longer live um, close together, we, we have to build more roads and more highways and, and have more um, use more fuel to get around and these kind of things. So, so I think that that again, that kind of tension of what what a city is and, and how it offers solutions, but also offers um, or, or, you know, generates some of those problems is is a is a real key to, to what I think about. Great, great, interesting. Wow. So, Professor Bennett, uh, welcome uh, as well to our to our discussion today. So, I've seen you described as an ecosystem ecologist. Uh, which seems like the sort of uh, job description that would result in you being keenly interested in the state of the environment. Um, so what sorts of environmental and sustainability questions do you and your colleagues explore in your work? Yeah, I, my interest really is in, in the connection and the relationships between people and nature, the way that nature can support human well-being and the way that the things that we do on the landscape influence nature in ways that then affect our uh, well-being. Uh, so like Kevin, a uh, part of what I'm doing is involved with the McGill Sustainability Systems Initiative, in my case, through their landscapes theme. And I took that on in part because of my interest in landscapes and in people's interactions with landscapes. And the way that looks right now now, a lot of my research focuses on working landscapes. So those are not the pristine places that conservationists are often drawn to, but the places where there is this really complex interaction between people and nature, places like agricultural landscapes or forestry landscapes where, where we're extracting timber, places where we're uh, developing fisheries or trying to get energy. And what my research focuses on is trying to understand how we can manage those landscapes for long-term sustainability so that we, not just the food that we're interested out of the agricultural landscape, but also all the other things that make those landscapes special to us, like 
a sense of place and beauty and carbon storage that helps regulate climate or flood control. Um, and we know, we have a sense at least that the geology, the biology, the ecology and the social systems are all interacting to provide all of those benefits, which we call ecosystem services. Um, and what I'm interested in is where are the levers? What levers do we have access to that control which services are delivered, to whom, and how sustainably that's done over time? Mm -hmm. Great. So let's address this question that we use as a title for today's discussion. What is sustainability anyway? Um, and I'd love to ask each of you maybe to de define for us your interpretation of the meaning of sustainability and why the rest of us need to pay attention to this issue and to the work that you and your colleagues are undertaking in this broad discipline. So Professor Bennett, if it's okay, maybe I'll stick with you uh, to, to answer that question first. Sure. I mean, I think we have some pretty basic definitions of sustainability that are, at least on the surface, pretty straightforward and simple. Those sound something like sustainability is meeting present needs without sacrificing our ability to meet those needs in the future. And on the surface, that's a pretty simple, straightforward uh, definition. But if we just peek a little bit under the surface, I think it gets complicated very quickly. So for example, what does it mean? What is a need versus a want? How do I know what the need, the actual need is? Um, who gets to decide what the need is? How are meeting people's needs, how is that distributed? Um, is it only the wealthy people or the educated people who get their needs met or is it all people? What if there's a real trade-off between meeting my need and meeting uh, Kevin's need? Um, that's where these questions around sustainability go from being this meeting present needs without sacrificing the future or meeting everybody's needs into something that is really much more complex that, that really requires um, scientific, where I'll, I'll say science, meaning not just natural science, but social science and economics and law. It needs a, a focus on answering these really complicated, messy questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And again, I hope we'll get into some of these deeper uh, issues in the, in the time we have to get it today. But let me turn it back to you, Professor Mano. Um, would you agree with that uh, assessment or, or do you have sort of a different take coming from maybe your sort of urban uh, framework of your research? Um, no, I, I really like what Elena just described. I think that's definitely something that, that I agree with as, as, a, as a definition. And, and this, this idea that in some ways, I think we, I think we all kind of have an idea of this idea of sustaining for future generations and, and you know, meeting our own needs. That, that seems to be something that we all, I, maybe I shouldn't say all, but most people who think about this at all agree with that to, to some degree, right? And I think two things that I can maybe add, I mean, one thing that I think fascinating from a lot of the work I've done, especially in, in sort of more sort of environmental justice framing of, of these questions, um, quite similar to what Lena would just explain, but but it's, you know, we think about the idea of, of you know, not using up resources in order to preserve them for future generations. I think a really fascinating framing is, is to think about, you know, not using, thinking about people who are currently alive as well and not, not these sort of imaginary people in the future. And I think this leads to exactly what was just referenced um, by Professor Bennett, but there's, you know, we then start thinking about current people who, who also need, um, who are also struggling, you know, with poor life satisfaction or well-being or, or health. And so, you know, thinking about these questions simply for future generations um, sort of masks this idea that, that we should, I, I think my definition of sustainability would include, um, you know, all people who are currently living, especially those who, who don't have enough um, resources or, um, you know, are living lives of, of misery or, you know, but so a meaningful life for all. And I mean, one definition, that sort of this idea of a just sustainability is something that, that motivates my work, which is um, basically just adds a few words to that sort of classic Brundtland style definition, um, but it's more along the lines of um, the need to ensure a better quality of life for all now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of how I would frame that slightly different. Um, right. 
Okay. So, so in my case, so in the absence of a PhD and, and years of scholarship, um, I turned to Google before this webcast and uh, sort of landed on the definition of sustainability that I actually liked, uh, which I think is very similar to what, what you've uh, both mentioned. It was to meet our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Um, so let me ask you, you know, with thinking that, let me ask you both this question. Um, I guess it's the basic question that most people have when they think about the sustainability of the planet. And that is, you know, can the planet su sustain and support a population of our size now in excess of 7.8 billion, I believe, you know, and all of our current activities, the cars we drive, our airplanes, our factories, and, and the waste we produce each year? Uh, or are we looking at a situation where if our actions go unchecked, uh, that we are in fact gonna ruin the planet for our children and their children and, and so on? Uh, Professor Bennett, you wanna jump in on that one first? Sure, um, I mean, we're, we're pretty clearly currently in what I would call overshoot in terms of we are overusing the planet can provide in, in all sorts of different ways. And there's a lot of different ways that researchers have developed to measure this. So you might see uh, the overshoot day, like the day on which we've used one earth year's worth of resources that I think now happens sometime in April most years. Um, you might hear about uh, Jan Rockstrom and the planetary tipping points or Kate Rayworth and the economic donut. These are all different ways that we've developed to try to measure the human impact. And, and pretty much all of them say, we're we're overusing what we should have access to if we want to be doing this sustainably. Then we need to get into the question that I think is is hidden within the question you just asked, because you mentioned both population and then you mentioned some of the things we're doing: cars, airplanes, factories, waste. Um, and I think there are sort of two arms to that, which one of which is population and the other of which is consumption. And both of those are playing a really important role here in creating that situation of, of, of overshoot, both that we have a lot of people on the planet and that number of people consuming in the way that we currently consume together puts us in that, that state of, of overshoot. Uh, it's hard to say in any rigorous academic sense, you know, what is the ideal population or the ideal amount of consumption, but it's pretty clear to me that both of those uh, need some, some pretty significant attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Professor Mana, um, so I know we've heard ecologists and others, you know, issuing these kinds of dire warnings um, for years now, it seems. Um, so maybe the question I'll put to you is, you know, between us friends and, and, and alumni, um, do, in your opinion, do we have a true understanding of how serious the, the situation is right now? Are we in fact facing our imminent demise as a species? Um, or has the end of the planet been greatly exaggerated for a long time? Um, or is the answer much more complicated than, than A or B in this case? Um, well, exactly. I think, I think the... The, the problem, I don't think the problem has been exaggerated. I, I think, I think this, I think as, as, as Professor Bennett was just explaining too, I mean, I think it's pretty, there's vast amounts of evidence that we're, that we're using too many resources, um, that we're, um, that we're generating too much waste, that we're, you know, that we're overshooting on all, on all these levels. Um, as far as, I mean, I'm not a climate scientist or someone who can really speak well to, um, the actual impacts of, of, of climate change and, but but it's it's clear that there's a serious problem, and as far as but I wouldn't go so far as to say that our imminent demise is 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 just around the corner. I, th I think we are, and maybe we'll get to some of that later. But I, but I think we are kind of thinking uh, there are some positive steps going on. There are, there are there's a lot of great work being done, a lot of changes that are happening, and. Another thing which I think relates to this, maybe relates to the previous question as well, is I mean, I, mean, I often think about this idea when we think about the you think about the, the sort of vocabulary or you know, you know, sustainability, and and I often start have been thinking about this idea of like what do we want to sustain, and and I think that there's certain things you know we know we can't sustain, and I think even this COVID nineteen situation has has put a sort of harsh spotlight on some of this, you know, that maybe we can't sustain current lifestyle which includes a lot of international air travel or or you know or certain 
you know, diets or certain, you know, size of homes. I mean, I mean all of these things, um, you know, that but I think framing it in, in what we want to sustain. And I would go so far as even to think about more sort of social and cultural factors. You know, do we want to sustain a society that, that clearly has problems with systematic racism or, or it has problems with, um, you know, sexism and homophobia? I mean, there's all kinds of things in our society and culture that we probably don't want to sustain. And, and, and I think that that's a can be a useful way to, to, to frame some of these, these questions as well. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Bennett, I'll turn the next question to you, um, and that is, how do we fix this, um, or, or who is going to fix this? And is it really a question of us as society looking to people such as yourselves, the scientists, to say, all right, you know, scientists, come up with better ways to do things and we'll adapt to it? Or is it really more on society and citizens to lead that charge and be willing to accept that the current planet, the current way of doing things is, is, is not sustainable in the long term? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I really firmly believe that this needs to come from all of us collectively and as individuals. And scientists can do some things, but fundamentally, this isn't a technological problem. And uh, I, I may be uh, talking myself out of a job here, but I, I don't think this is even a problem of knowledge or knowing. There's some interesting questions out there left to, to, to address for us researchers, but this is really fundamentally a societal issue where I think every one of us needs to take individual responsibility and individual action. And I, I know sometimes when I say that, what comes up is it's so much more powerful when we take action as a society. And, and yes, I think that we should also be doing that and enacting policies and doing things that try to nudge people into the right uh, uh, directions. Um, but I don't want anything to take the focus off of the responsibility that I think each of us has as, as individuals to try to do our very best. And, and I also think that taking those individual actions actually leads to more societal actions. There's a feedback there that um, going a little bit of the direction towards what we need to do as individuals can help us get farther through the direction that we need to be as a society. And if people are willing to make sacrifices, it makes it easier to enact uh, policies to to put those things in place, sort of make it you know more likely people are doing uh, uh, are doing the right thing. So I guess you know to me this mm -hmm. this needs to come from us, and it's uh, it's time for us to stop blaming other people, whether that's you know other people who are having too many babies and making the population big, or corporations who are somehow forcing us to. Uh, to to buy things or whatever it is, like mm -hmm. nope, it, it's us, it's you, it's me, and uh, we need to start acting, uh, and we need to start acting now. I will say just to go back to the earlier question um, because I think you used the word dire, and and I I just want to agree with what Kevin was saying that you know this is a uh, we are definitely in a difficult situation. We're definitely in a situation where we need to take action. Um, but I do think sometimes when we, when we uh, get too far to the, um, it's dire and we're all going to die out tomorrow, we, we sort of get into this panic mode where it's actually makes it harder for us to do the things that we need to, to do. So I think it's super important. I think we need to act now um, and keep our eyes focused on the, the long term. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Professor Manoff, from your perspective uh, and, and really the lens of sort of what's happening in cities and urban environments, do you see any move towards a, a greater awareness and understanding of the environment and sustainability? Are people, in fact, um, you know, leaving their cars at home and, and adopting public transit and, and, and bicycling more? Uh, or is it all just talk at this point and we haven't really seen these tangible changes? Um. Well, one thing I'll say in, in relation to what Professor Bennett was just saying, I think that there's, there's, I agree very much with, with, with her take on, on, you know, that it takes, you know, it's, it's individual action. It's, it's, it is collective action as well. It's, it's sort of, it's also 
top-down government action. And that's one thing that may maybe slightly different in my my perspective from from a transport planner is, is that importance of the sort of top-down piece where where you know one thing, one aspect I use a lot in my own teaching, for example, is is you know, if you look at the variance across nations of of you know car ownership and vehicle miles traveled, you know, which is a common indicator of of how much people are using cars, um, it's almost entirely explained by things. You know, that variance is almost entirely explained by things like fuel tax and and you know, vehicle registration rates and um, and density of cities. And but even just the economic part, even just sim simply saying the fuel tax and you know how much it costs to register and insure a vehicle explains a lot of the variance in how much people use and own cars. And and that's an example of where something that, that isn't really an individual choice. It's that's that's individual just sort of doing what makes the most economic sense in their in their situation. People aren't gonna buy three cars and, and have a two hour commute if if fuel tax is literally twenty times higher than it is in, in the US, for example. And so you know it's not a big surprise when you look at that the United States has you know some of the some of the lowest rates of, of fuel tax, for example, and that really explains a lot of that that change. And mm -hmm. and maybe to answer more directly your question, I mean, I mean, I think that there's there's I think there's a lot of awareness around things like you know changing modes to less polluting modes, people you know stopping driving to use public transit and or to, to, to walk or cycle. Um, but again, it's also another thing that fits into this this example I'm giving that that you know if there's not a safe place to bike or a safe place if it's not safe to walk if if locations aren't um, close enough to walk. And again, those decisions that cities make, you know, are, are can there be multifamily housing here that's near, that's near a place that people want to go? That's, that's not a, you know, that's a decision that, that planners are making that people who are in charge of, of zoning laws um, that are, that are impacting the way developers, what they can build and, and where they can build it, which is another example of this kind of what I think of this sort of environmental justice type questions around sustainability is that, it, you know, my, my, you know, my, my profession as a planner, my, my training as a planner, you know, we, we have all these kind of fantasies of these green urban leafy neighborhoods that you, know, you can walk and cycle everywhere. And, and but there's, but there's a huge affordability question there in terms of who can, who can afford to live in these kind of things. So, so basically who can afford sustainability is another kind of, kind of one of these kind of wicked questions that I think it should be, can and should be part of this discussion in, in terms of this. This isn't something we is sort of equitably distributed for all. It, it's it's something that you know has a premium in terms of you know if you're going to live in a place that's safe and comfortable and um, has lots of trees and um, that's that's not you know available to everybody. Mm -hmm. So let me just follow up because uh, you mentioned you know the fuel tax is a great example. I mean, do you feel that we kind of need our governments to enact punitive legislation? to get us to become more aware of the environment i'm thinking like you know take smoking as an example you know you know once the government's put in you know high enough taxes on cigarettes you know we saw the numbers of smokers drop even though they were also saving their lives as maybe a byproduct of that but i mean are we are we waiting or do we need these more punitive laws that will convince us to do the right thing is that what you're sort of suggesting I mean, a short answer would be yes. I, I think it's it's more nuanced than that. But but I but I do support um, you know policies again that exist in most of Western Europe and other places in the world that that make it more difficult to to own and operate a car as as one example. Um, and there's there's also in terms of I mean one kind of exciting thing that's happening um, in Edmonton right now is is they've gotten rid of. I mean, the, the basically the need for developers to include parking in any new development, for example. And so that that's something that you know drives again how cities are actually designed and for, for many, many decades, especially in the US, but also in Canada and other places, there were there were parking minimums. You know, if, if you build a store, you must provide you know four or five parking spots. If you build a an apartment building, you need you know, at least, you know, a minimum of one, one lot per, per unit, for example. And this simple change of saying, well, actually, you know, you don't need to do that, you know, <laughs> can have, it has a huge impact on the amount of space that we need to develop again and making, it's all about these choices again. I mean, cities make choices about how to allocate space, about how to, um, you know, what, you know, sticking to this transport idea, but, you know, what, you know, how space is allocated for different modes, um, where they invest in, in different things. And so, 
may, maybe punitive is not necessarily the best way to, to frame this, but 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 in terms of of you know putting the money where where the priorities are is, is something that that I that I fully support. Right. You know, so I think Kevin, coercive, a, but yeah, go ahead, uh, Professor Bennett. I, see just, I think you. it's a really interesting example, the Edmonton example, because one thing it shows off is that it doesn't have to be a negative or a taking away. There, there's a lot of ways that we can do this that are actually that are adding to people's quality of life simply by just shifting the options that are that are available to those that that are more like what we what we want. Mm -hmm. But I, I I imagine it could also be quite divisive as well. Um, and I'm looking, for example, at the example you know, the example right here we're seeing in, in the city of Montreal, where we've got a municipal administration that is very keen on getting cars off the road, uh, expanding bicycle options, and and some in the community are are welcoming that you know very receptively and others uh, are are responding with quite a pushback so professor ben i mean how do we handle sort of the divisiveness of these policies that that and find a way that makes it work for everybody my my impression a lot of times when things are uh divisive like that uh is sometimes it's all of us responding with how we think things are going to end up. Like if you take away my parking spaces, I'm not gonna as many people coming to my store. And that often the, those fears turn out to be unfounded or, or at least some of the time they turn out to be unfounded. And a really good way to handle that uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but a good way to handle that is to increase the transparency of our communication. So to let people know this is where we're going this is why uh, to even invite comment and conversation so that you give people a chance to say, well, I'm afraid that not as many people are going to come to my store and I'm going to go out of business. How are we going to handle that? So you invite real in-depth conversation about how you're making changes, what kinds of changes you're making, why you think those things are going to be good uh, overall for the city. And, and that often does a lot to quell people's fears or give you a way to address them in advance and say, yeah, we definitely don't want stores to go out of business be just because we're providing fewer parking spaces. Let's see what we can do about that. Let's see what the research says about how this has worked in other, in other cities and really go into it well. That can do a lot to reduce the, the sort of apparent divisiveness of, of, of some of these actions. Because in the end, all people want to have, whether it's a livable city or, you know, a, an agricultural landscape that, that is beautiful, that they love, when we step back enough steps, we have pretty similar desires. We want to have meaningful lives. Uh, and if we can get to where we see eye to eye on that, then we often can make better decisions about how to move forward in these real specific instances. Mm -hmm. um, great. Well, thanks for that answer. Uh, just a reminder for anyone who's watching live, if you do have a question for our panelists, you can send it to us at aoc at mcgill.ca. We will get to a few questions from alumni in a few minutes. Uh, a couple more questions uh, from my end for both of you. Maybe I'll stick with you, Professor Bennett, for the first one. Uh, I'm curious to get your take on sort of, you know, the next generation, you know, where if you look at sort of the generation that's coming, and we've seen, um, obviously, our minds are diverted right now on on other issues, uh, the pandemic and, and such. But you know, even a year ago, we saw, you know, hundreds and 1000s of students, uh, young, young people marching in the streets and in cities around the world, demanding that we adults, you know, take more action on the environment and on sustainability. Um, is this a sign that society is becoming more aware of these issues um, and we just need to kind of let this next generation move up and take the reins of power and they're going to make the right decisions? Um, let me answer that with a yes and no. So I, I'll say I've been really inspired by watching the younger generation and I'll, I'll count my daughter uh, Talia in among that group, she's been leading a lot of environmental awareness activities out in the town where I live and at school, and she's super enthusiastic. And I see that happening with uh, kids her friend's age, sort of just becoming teenagers, you know, all the way through to the university students that I, that I see. There's a lot of awareness. There's a lot of enthusiasm and energy. I do think that 
um, it's not right for us to just wait for those folks to, you know, get to a position where they take the reins. I think it really is our job to help set up a system where it's easier to go the right direction. They, part of the reason that this has been so hard for us to solve isn't that people don't care or that we're not aware. It's, these are really, um, you know, what we might call wicked problems or very complex problems that are hard to unravel, that are hard to address in ways that are satisfying um, and, and that move us forward. Uh, and the wickedness or complexness of those problems isn't going to disappear just because we wait another 10 years for uh, these folks with more enthusiasm to grow up. So I think we need to start addressing them now and, and help make the situation easier, even as at the same time, I really am buoyed by the, the enthusiasm, by the increasing awareness, by the, the mm -hmm. increasing knowledge that I see out there. Right. Uh, Professor Mana, um, I know you're, much of your research focuses on social equality, and you, you've touched on that in some of your answers already, um, and, and specifically how decisions that are made at the local or municipal levels often have tremendously different impacts on various socioeconomic groups. Can you expand a bit on that for us and explain how this dynamic might shape policy for better or for worse? Yeah, as, as you mentioned, a lot of what I do looks at sort of disparate impacts of specifically like transport um, projects, for example. And a lot of what I've done in well, here in Montreal and other places as well is, is thinking about, um, you know, when, when a new subway line is built or, um, you know, a new bike lane is built, wh what are the impacts on different groups and, and you know, who's benefiting and who's, and who's sort of suffering. And I think that's a sort of classic, um, you know, it sort of tragically repeats itself in city after city, these ideas that the people who are um, gaining in benefits um, are, you know, are often wealthy people and, and people who are, are getting only the kind of exposure to danger or exposure to highway noise or, or vibrations or, you know, both local pollution and, and you, know, you know, things that get into lungs and cause all kinds of problems um, are, are most often poor racialized communities. And that's something that, um, again, more on a sort of positive spin. I think I think something that the current government or, or the of Montreal is doing is, is at least thinking through some of these ideas about um, you know where to put the new new subway infrastructure, for example. I mean, there's the, the pink line and the blue line that are under under study now, or you know, there's some they're making some progress on these things, and, and they were very specifically brought out with these kind of social equity lens of kind of, of looking at you know, where places in the, in the city where people have what we often call transport poverty, which is kind of basically like a, you know, people that are sort of socially disadvantaged for, for various reasons, you know, based on income and, and, and racialized identities and being new immigrants, but also have poor access to the transport network that allows them to access jobs or, or things that make their life meaningful. And that's, that's why we build transport. It's not just move around. It's so people can access the things that, that bring them happiness or, or meaning in their life. And so, so basically that those are things that we can map out and, and say where, where are places in the city that, that are in a state of transport poverty that sort of one could argue deserve better, better transit better better mobility options and that's something that seems to be sort of on the table at least in terms of making decisions based on um, on those kind of ideas for because for decades transport um, planning you know was dominated by this kind of engineering approach of just kind of you know maximizing speed minimizing travel time uh, maximizing the efficiency of the system and I've definitely seen a shift even since I've done my PhD I think I think these kind of indicators that are more around um, um, social equity and transport, sort of uh, like transport justice is another term people are using. Um, so it's, it's, it goes beyond simply, you know, how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but how can we ensure that, that you know, all members of society are, have access to these, these kinds of systems, these kind of low carbon systems that we want, you know, that are safe and comfortable and convenient for, for all members of society. 
Great, great. Thank you. So before we turn to some of the questions that have come in from our alumni and viewers, uh, I do want to ask you, Professor Bennett, uh, a bit more about the Seeds of Anthropocene project uh, that I referenced earlier and that you co-founded with colleagues from around the world. Um, so I guess I have two, two questions. One is, um, maybe you can tell us what is an Anthropocene? Um, and can you explain to us a bit about some of the goals of this international collaboration and why you think it's so important to the conversation around the environment and sustainability issues? Sure. Uh, okay, so that's a lot of questions. So the Anthropocene is a term that we use uh, to describe uh, the current state of the, the planet, the current uh, epoch that we're living in. It's not officially an epoch like the Holocene, but it's used informally to describe a period where uh, people uh, have are having a noticeable and large impact on the way that the planet functions. And, you know, as you can tell from the topics of conversation that we've had so far in our conversation, that often brings up a lot of concern for people. You know, are we uh, using too much of the planet? Are things sustainable? How bad is it? Uh, and so uh, with a group of colleagues from the Stockholm Resilience Center and the Center for Complex Systems and Transition in South Africa, I started this project called Seeds of Good Anthropocenes, and it really was about uh, trying to find examples of things people are doing, just small steps, to try to make their communities better, uh, to try to lead towards a transform transformation to a better world, an Anthropocene where uh, people are having a, a good and not a detrimental impact. And so what we've done is collect so far about 500 projects like this from all around the world where people are doing, uh, they might be doing uh, ecological things or social things or a mixture of social and ecological that are trying to make uh, the environment, uh, their environment, better, uh, a better place. And we're doing things with those examples. So we're studying them, trying to understand why some are more successful than, than others, uh, why some seem to lead to transformation that grows or expands beyond the original boundary in terms of either the ideas or the place, and why others stay small. Uh, and we're using them to also do more scenario development of thinking about possible futures for different communities and for the planet where we actually envision positive futures and think about the pathways to get there because that's a great way to get people both thinking positively, feeling positive, and seeing, oh, it just takes these steps to get to the kind of existence that I that I want. And I, I should say in particular, we've been working uh, at McGill to develop a, a Seeds of McGill project uh, where we're really looking at what are the small things that McGill students and staff and faculty are doing to try to make McGill a greener place, a better place uh, into the future, and doing all the same things there, studying why some uh, work better than others, uh, the, the trying to study how McGill and the administration can help support the ones that are li more likely to be successful going into the future. And we have thousands of students and thousands of alumni. All of those people are really eager to try to make McGill even better than it, than it already is right now. And so what this is doing is really providing a, a platform for, well, what are some good ideas? How can and we move things forward. There's a lot of power in those thousands of people and our ability to move things forward in a positive, uh, in a positive way. So that's this project, Seeds of a Good Anthropocene and uh, Seeds of a, of, a, of a Good or Better McGill. We don't have a good name for that one. <laughs> uh, um, but I, th I think those are really important. Great, great. Well, thank you for, for that explanation. And I think it, it shows that it's not just, you know, scaremongering and dire warnings that will motivate people. Perhaps it is showcasing some of the good work that's happening uh, that people can take inspiration from. So, so let's turn now to some of the questions that were submitted to us by alumni. Uh, if you do have a question, you can email us at aoc at mcgill.ca. We have quite a few. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Uh, but if you have one, we'll try to squeeze it in. I'm going to start with this first one that actually came in while we were on air speaking. Um, it's a bit of a tricky one, and I'm not sure who wants to volunteer, but I'll take it. It comes from Peter Stricker, and his question is short. It's, um, 
In your work on sustainability, how much math modeling do you perform and how much is conjecture? Um, Professor Bennett, that's you. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll jump and I'll just talk about it from my own, uh, my own personal approach. It really depends on the question. So for some things, seeds of a good Anthropocene, it's, it's, we don't engage very much in math. It's more logical concepts and systems thinking. For projects that I'm working on, um, like where I'm measuring ecosystem services, those benefits from nature that are provided by landscapes, uh, it's heavy, heavily empirical data that we're collecting, and then mathematical models that we're building to try to understand the relationships between ecology, uh, societies, and the services that are provided. So it, it's, um, I would say, I span the whole range from projects that are pretty much math-free to projects that have pretty advanced mathematical modeling as, at, the, at the heart of them. Mm hmm. Great. All right. Um, did you want to jump in, Professor Mana, or like? Well, I'm very quickly. I mean, I have a very similar response. Right. I mean, that you know, some some of the work is 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 just very sort of qualitative, based on interviews with with planners, for example, where there's you know zero math to um, to a lot of sort of you know sort of modeling greenhouse gas emissions in different sort of transport scenarios and, and things like that, mm -hmm. or or sort of mode choice regression models, which are very math heavy, um, but but aren't Maybe the question is more based on these kind of sort of climate models and things, which 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 is simply isn't something that I do at all. But but there is a lot of you know math and statistics based on on some of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's turn to this next one. Uh, this one came in ahead of time from uh, Just or Just Harwig. Um, do McGill researchers adhere to the belief that the perennial pursuit of economic growth that now drives our global economy is still possible, or that it even ever was possible in the closed system that is our earth. The law of conservation of mass offers the absolute prediction, no, it is not possible. Um, and, that no answer has, and that no answer has consequences. The further economic growth that is needed to provide jobs for a still growing global population must be directed to repairing the environmental damage already done. Any comments on, on that perspective? Um, Mano, you want <laughs> I can I can try. It's, it's, it's a tricky question. I mean, I mean, first of all, um, I can always speak for myself. I, I don't I don't I don't want to try to answer a question about what McGill researchers um, do or don't believe. But 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 I don't think that the idea of of sort of unlimited economic growth is is something that um, myself I'll, I'll I'll stick to speaking for myself is definitely not a paradigm that I'm um, in support of. I think there and and I think that there's I mean, again, a lot of the work that I've done and, and colleagues I mean, focuses on, on how so much of what actually makes for meaningful lives and, and, and happy people isn't based on, on increased consumption and, and, you know, resource extraction. And a lot, of, a lot of things that make our lives meaningful are, are things like social connections. And, and I think the more we focus on, on well-being of, of residents, of, of people, the less we move away from a sort of insistence on there being more economic growth. Um, maybe maybe I'll keep it to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and let's move, so that's great. Thank you. Uh, so let's move on to this next one. This one is from uh, Harold Forster. Um, it's about electric vehicles. Uh, so he says the prol pro the proliferation of electric vehicles is being perceived as a contributor to reducing pollution, greenhouse gases, and global warming. This makes sense in jurisdictions where electricity is produced by renewable means, such as solar power and hydroelectricity, such as in Quebec and in British Columbia. But in most areas, electricity is produced by burning fossil fuels, and in some cases, mostly by the burning of coal. In these latter cases, would driving electric vehicles not be more harmful to the environment and to sustainability compared to regular vehicles that burn gasoline or diesel fuel? Um, great question. I'll, ahead, I'll, I guess <laughs> I'll jump, jump in there, I guess. That's something I have strong opinions about. Um, the, I mean, I agree with the premise of the question. I mean, I, I think that's this, I think, the idea of electric cars being you know being a solution to a lot of this sort of sustainability of, of transport is i think is it again it's not something that i am really excited about i, mean, I, I think that there's i think even more in the question i can even take that farther i guess i mean there, there's this, uh, there's obvious questions around the source of electricity 
And you know, the just what comes out of the tailpipe of the car is is not the most important thing, but the whole sort of supply chain of, of where that is is built and, and where the emissions actually are happening. And I think even more importantly, as as I kind of hinted at earlier in some of my responses, I mean the I mean, car dependence is is responsible for a huge amount of of you know land use and and ecosystem disruption and whether or not the car is driving on the roads and parking in the parking lots and and parking outside someone's home you know is is it's it's almost irrelevant to what what the, the what fuel is being used to to run or what energy source is being used to run the car if we think about wider um, issues about safety and and you know space in cities and and other places and so. And, and plus other things that come out. I mean, the the sort of PM two point five that comes off of braking and and tire wear and things like that 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 doesn't change just when you swap out the energy source of a vehicle. Mm-hmm. So um, I support the idea of electric vehicles there as being sort of having less emissions than than gas burning cars in some cases. But but I would really like to think in terms of broader solutions that that make people less dependent on using cars or all these other, you know, this the long list of things that, that they're responsible for. Right. So Professor Bennett, I'm actually curious to get uh, your take on this. I mean, when we, I know you're, you're studying sort of land use generally. I mean, is it a case where, you know, the prol- proliferation of cars and vehicles have, you know, inspired or convinced people to go out further and further afield and, and use more land? Or is it that people have sort of clamored out the urban sprawl they've gone in to take over this land and now they need to feed this need by having more cars i mean how how and how does this spiral ever end yeah i really like the question for the sense of systems that's inherent in the question and if i were to answer i would answer almost exactly uh what 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 kevin had to say that that um it's really this is complex i think the question you're asking now is very hard to answer because it's very hard to point to what's the cause and what's the effect because what you have is a sort of complex system where those things are are interacting with each other and sprawl is creating the need for cars is creating the desire for more sprawl and it, we sort of cycle off there and it's why i think things like the work that that professor mana is doing to help us uh, understand how we can break that that system and do something new that doesn't require us to uh, purchase endless new cars and and flee out to suburbs is really really uh, an important uh, an important step mm-hmm. great thank you uh- so the question has just come in, Professor Manaw, this one, I mean, might as well have your name on it. I'll just read it to you. It comes from uh, Carol Laniel, uh, and she says that the elderly, disabled, and other people with mobility problems often seem to be neglected or underserved in the current focus on active transportation. Why do you think this population doesn't come to mind in urban planning? Hmm. That's, a, that's a great question and, and a difficult question. I think something that, um, because again, I agree with the the sort of premise of the question that I think that those pe- people with um, you know a lot of the discourse assumes able-bodied people um, a lot of the sort of design of intersections and crosswalk countdown you know the timing of the lights assumes a certain speed of, of walking um, and so it's true that the people who don't sort of move their bodies at the sort of accepted or, or sort of um, what what is considered a sort of normal speed often get neglected there are some moves recently in terms of sort of universal design and, and the idea of an eight to 80 city, for example, you know, designing for people, you know, whether you're eight years old walking to school or, or you're 80 years old, you know, walking um, to do some shopping, you know, that, that the city and, and network should be there to, to, to provide you what you, what you need. Um, so it's probably, probably not a very satisfying answer to the, to the, to the to the caller to the to the viewer, um, but I but I think the, the work needs to be done in terms of making sure that both both the sort of voices of what's need and the people brought into into the actual sort of you know you know planning you know under, understanding what people need because a lot of most most transport planners are able bodied people in their you know 30s, 40s, 50s. They're they're not people um, who are who use a wheelchair, they're not people, they're not um, people with visual impairments. I mean, and so all, all those voices need to be at the table to, to make sure we're designing for, for everybody. 
Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm glad we were able to address that question. Um, we have time, I guess, for one more question. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, turn it to you, uh, Professor Bennett. Um, we have received several questions ahead of time and during the, this broadcast about the size of the, the population. And I know we addressed it earlier. Um, so maybe I'll just sort of read part of a question that came in this morning. And this one came in from Jeff Budd. Um, and essentially, he wants to know if we have any chance of achieving sustainability without a vast reduction in total population. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, there is an interaction between population and consumption that means that, that, um, you know, we probably need to be doing both some control or management of population. And, and I am moving from control to management because it's, this is not about, uh, you know, getting into the, the mode of forced sterilization, but is a lot more about providing education to women, which, which turned to be one of the most effective ways to reduce population, providing uh, access to birth control where it's desired. Um, so, you know, we can do things to manage population. We can also do things to manage consumption. I, I think Sometimes um, we hear a lot about the consumption issue here in North America, where we probably rightly should, because if we look at what's going on in North America, and especially in Quebec, we don't have a rapidly growing population here, a real issue with consumption here. And so the things that we have control over our own selves and our own societies are the kitchen side of things. So I would argue that's where our conversation here should be focused is on the consumption side of things. That's not to say that population isn't important, that we shouldn't address it, that we shouldn't be providing better education uh, and, and contraception to women around the world, especially in places where population is growing quickly. But I think uh, for us as a making some assumptions about our audience here, but for myself as a North American, the issue is uh, for me is a lot more about consumption for my own, for my own self. Ultimately, we're going to need to address both of them. There's just no way uh, around it. And I would say rather than get into this sort of well-worn battle about is the problem population or is the problem consum consumption, we ought to just say, yes, and. The problem is both, and we got to address both, figure out where we can make the most impact based on where we're standing and the levers that we have access to, and get to it. Great, great. Well, thank you uh, for that answer, and, and thank you both uh, for for your time today. Uh, I'm looking at the clock, and I see we're just about at the at the end of the uh, the end of the hour, I, I often end by asking people for some final parting words and some maybe notes of optimism. But I think in this case, you've both uh, done that really well and provided that throughout your answers. And uh, uh, no worries, Professor Bennett, I don't think you've managed to talk yourself out of a job at McGill with, uh, with your contributions today. Um, so as I mentioned, that does uh, just about wrap up the time we do have for today. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may have not been able to tune in live. If you are a McGill graduate who is not currently receiving our emails but would like to be added to our distribution list, you can visit alumni.mcgill.ca slash register to sign up. And this link is available beneath the video player on our YouTube channel as well. I would, of course, like to extend my deep gratitude to our two panelists, Kevin Mana and Elena Bennett from the McGill School of Environment and their respective departments at McGill for sharing their views with us, as well as to Heather McShane and Larissa Jarvis from the McGill Sustainability Systems Initiative for all of their hard work behind the scenes to help us develop this four-part series on sustainability. Speaking of which, please be sure to come back again in two weeks' time on Thursday, September 17th, for our second installment, when a new panel of McGill researchers and students will join me to answer more questions, including whether the world's response to COVID-19 can inform our actions on sustainability. And I can already give you a sneak peek. It's complicated. So until then, please stay safe and be well.
born.